Greetings Geometry students. Today we're going to be taking a look at what will become the final set of notes and information that is going to go towards our Unit 1 test. And today we are discussing types of geometries. Please copy down the title as well as your objective and your essential question. Now our objective for the day is going to be to, uh, the student will learn the different geometries and the definitions that separate them. The language objective, which is what I'm trying to get you to do, is the student will demonstrate the ability to distinguish the, between the different geometries in provided scenarios. A central question for you to ask yourself at the conclusion of the notes and the assessment or assignment is can I tell the difference between the different geometries and do I know the rules that caused those differences? As always, anytime you need more time to copy something down, simply hit pause and then press play when you're ready to move forward. And you can always rewind anytime you need more uh, time or if you just want to hear something again. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, now Euclidean geometry, which is the basic high school uh, curriculum of what we study, and 99.9% .9 of everything that we talk about this year is going to be Euclidean geometry. Now, we've already talked about a little bit of this, so if I'm repeating myself, please forgive me, uh, but let's face it, we need a little repetition in order to make sure we're staying on top of things. Euclidean geometry is the study of flat space. We've talked about the three things that Euclid basically boiled everything down into, which are points and lines and planes. And the highest dimension that anything gets uh, between points and lines and planes is two dimensions. So the largest dimension that Euclid gets in is the second dimension, that is flat space. Of course, Euclidean geometry is based upon the Greek mathematician Euclid's books, which were called the Elements. Now keep in mind a lot of people were doing work on geometry. Euclid is the mathematician that's given credit for kind of gathering everything all together, giving it a single singular language and kind of tying all the concepts into a singular idea. Now this was all happening around 300 BC, so we are well beyond uh, 2,000 years, about 2,300 years ago, was when Euclid was doing all of this. So as you can imagine, we are talking about some pretty cutting-edge thinking for that particular time. The elements actually extended to be 13 books long, uh, and uh, you know, it's just these are just you know not real like t long textbooks like we're talking about now. Just little handheld, probably what we would consider to be you know more like a, a small novel in size, and uh, but very difficult mathematics, very technical explanation, stuff like that. But it took him 13 books worth of space in order to finish uh, his compilation. Now Euclid's geometry is based upon uh, or constructed upon what we call definitions and undefined terms. Now again, those, those two seem like a little bit of a contradiction, okay, but definitions are, are things like we have, like the definition for a point, the definition for a line, the definition for a plane. Now with undefined terms, it's not necessarily saying like terms that don't have a definition or words that have no definition. It's more like ideas that do not necessarily need uh, definitions. Okay. Now, <clears throat> definitions come from things like theorems, and we've mentioned this briefly, and it's something we absolutely are responsible for. Theorems are truthful arguments that must be proven. They're typically very technical and describing situations that are not common sense, uh, things that would have to be explained to us in order for us to get a very uh, reasonable understanding for what is going on. A more undefined term would be more like a postulate. These are logical statements that can be accepted without proof. 
and we kind of think of these a little bit like common sense and to put it in more recent terms kind of like inductive reasoning we make our observations and then we make our statements based upon those observations simply because that's the way that it has to be not because a textbook or a dictionary or anything like that told us it had to be that way okay so you've got a definition there for theorems and postulates and that's something that we're going to need to de uh, dedicate a little study time to as well okay those are terms that we are responsible for knowing okay now Euclid's uh, work on the elements and geometry stood for basically 2,000 years until in the 1800s which is also the 19th century many of his definitions and ideas began to come into question but still 2,000 years worth of uh, solidarity on his uh, works that's that's a pretty substantial accomplishment at any rate, one of Euclid's definitions that uh, stated that the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. Okay, so this was Euclid's idea of distance. We've already kind of touched on this a little bit this year. The problem is that a more realistic approach to the idea of distance yielded a new branch of geometry. Now, anything that is not Euclidean geometry is simply referred to as non-Euclidean geometry. However, there are different disciplines within non-Euclidean geometry, so we don't just call everything Euclidean or non-Euclidean. Now, the first branch that we're looking at is one that we've already talked about, and here's where it comes from. Since in reality we can off, uh, we cannot often proceed directly from one point to another without detours, taxicab geometry was formed. And this was the simple idea that there may be obstructions in the real world that we must detour around. We cannot uh, always pass through open spaces simply to get from one point to another point just because we want to. So we must detour around things in order to accomplish uh, the goal of reaching a destination. Now clearly the thing is with taxicab geometry there are multiple ways to proceed from one point to the next. If we are simply moving along the grid with the idea that we want to get from one point to the other and we do not deviate away from that idea, in other words we don't move away from one point to another, as long as we're proceeding from one point to another there's several different ways to accomplish this destination. And the thing that we're kind of looking at at this moment is this, and it may not seem that it's going to be this way, but if you were to actually count the grid lines of any of the green line or blue line or red line or any other line that you could follow, uh, that as long as it was trying to go from one point to the next point, you would yield the same distance as any other route moving from one point to the other point. Okay. Now, a more fundamental failure came along uh, for Euclid and his theories, and this is kind of uh, known as Euclid's downfall, and it comes from what is referred to as the parallel lines postulate. Okay. Now let's review what Euclid's idea of parallel lines actually is. Now we already have a definition for parallel in, uh, in the classroom, and that is lines that are in the same plane and do not intersect. Euclid's definition is a little bit more technical than that, as I've already told you. I'm doing the best I can to kind of boil things down into as simple of language as possible. But for this, we're going to have to actually see uh, what Euclid was talking about, so we can't keep it as simple as possible. But here's what he said. Okay, Euclid stated for any point, okay, so we're going to start off with a point in a graph. For any point that is not on a line, okay, so here comes a line that does not make contact with the point. For any point not on a line, there is a line passing through this point. Obviously, there are several lines that can pass through this point, but we're not finished yet. 
Okay, there's a line passing through this point that is parallel to the original line. So there's our parallel markers for these two lines. And in so doing, there is going to be another line and only one other line that passes through this point and is perpendicular to both of the lines at the same time. Now, if you piece all of this information together, what you have just accomplished is graphically an example of what parallel lines should be doing. And this is actually a diagram we're going to be spending a little bit of time later on this year uh, working on. Okay, but this was Euclid's idea. Now, Euclid's idea was even more complicated than this, but again, I'm boiling it down to as simple of terms as I can so that you can get the idea and also understand what's going on here. Okay, now the problem with this is, is Euclid being way back in 300 BC, he was thinking very two-dimensionally. And here in the last couple of centuries, mathematicians have begun to think on a higher dynamic level, and it stumbled across a, a lot of problems with some of Euclid's definitions, namely with the parallel lines postulate. Okay, so our world exists in more than two dimensions. So the mathematicians of the last couple hundred of years have tried to get Euclid's geometry off the paper and into the real world, and we've discovered some problems. Okay, so applying Euclid's idea of parallel lines to curved surfaces, we see some glaring problems with Euclid's parallel lines. Okay. So we're going to look at a couple of curved surfaces, one of them being the sphere. And of course, we have a lot of examples of spheres in the world. Okay, here we go, soccer ball. I love soccer, so that's my example that I chose. Okay, and they have the topic of spherical geometry, meaning the subjects that we study and the topics that we study can actually apply not necessarily to just a flat surface, but a curved surface. And that's going to cause some problems. Okay. We also have more inverted type of curves, similar to a horse saddle. Sorry, I'm not a horse person, but maybe some of y'all are. Okay, a horse saddle, and the nature of the inverted curve is called hyperbolic geometry. And again, many of Euclid's terms and ideas can be applied onto a, an inverted surface like this, but again, there were problems that began to arise uh, because of the nature of the surface. Okay, so let's take a look at what it was about the parallel lines postulate that ultimately started to kind of buckle Euclid's ideas about geometry. Okay. If you have the same idea of parallel lines on a curved surface like a sphere, okay, we can have the exact same definition that we had to begin with, that we have two lines that are running parallel to each other. There is a line that passes through a single point and is perpendicular to both of those lines. But look what happens to the lines as they try to continue wrapping around the surface of the sphere as opposed to continuing outwardly on a flat plane. You can see that the lines bend inward toward each other and they actually intersect. And that goes totally against Euclid's idea that the lines in the same plane would never touch. These lines are in the same plane and they are parallel with this line that is perpendicular to them, but they still bend inwardly and run into each other. So that was a definition that ultimately Euclid would not have been able to defend here in the three-dimensional world. With hyperbolic surfaces, again, two lines being parallel to each other, a single line passing through a point that is perpendicular to both of those lines along a hyperbolic surface, the lines bend away from each other. So once again, we can see that Euclid's idea of parallel breaks down. These lines are growing further apart, and that should not have happened in Euclid's world. Okay, so as ultimately the parallel lines postulate 
that has kind of gotten people saying, you know what, Euclid didn't have it entirely right. He did a, a great job. It held together for 2,000 years, but now we're starting to see some gaps and some flaws in Euclid's geometry, and that's, that's kind of the way... Um, Euclid's uh, information has fallen apart. Now there's even some more uh, types of geometry and let's take a look at a new age type of a, uh, a thought process. Now a more even more uh, modern version of geometry has developed here recently. Uh, kind of a radical way of thinking is what is referred to as fractal geometry. And there's a couple of a very interesting uh, kind of breakthrough thought processes that exist in fractal geometry and we're going to take a look at those and then I'll tell you what they believe fractal geometry is is really uh, going to apply to and what its main purpose is. Okay, one of the things that fractal geometry does that I find very interesting is the idea of non-integer dimensions. Now, if you're not familiar with what an integer is, uh, think back to your days of studying the number line. Uh, once upon a time. Uh, the number line, uh, the integers are what you typically mark on the number line when you're just drawing a generic number line. Uh, values like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2, and so on. Those are integers. So fractal geometry is looking at the idea that there might be values in between those as far as dimensions are concerned. Okay, so let's examine real quick the idea of dimensionality between what Euclid thought and what fractal geometry is trying to think. Okay, now here's a structure in Euclidean geometry and that is obviously the point. The point is the most, Euclid's most basic structure in zero dimensional space. Okay, so zero is an integer. That was one of Euclid's structures. Uh, here's another one of Euclid's structures. It is the line. The line is Euclid's most basic structure in first dimensional space. Okay. Here is the final structure that Euclid uh, hypothesized, and it is the plane, and the plane is the most basic structure that exists in second dimensional space. Now Euclid didn't really go beyond two dimensions, that's why Euclid, Euclidean geometry is the study of flat space. But as we well know, we can take Euclid's structures and we can combine them into, a, uh, into making three dimensional structures. So even though Euclid had not intended for the idea of three-dimensional geometry, his structures did uh, lead the way and make it possible for geometry to be constructed in the third dimension. Now, fractal geometry suggests that there are dimensions that exist between 0 and 1, and 1 and 2, and 2 and 3. And let me show you what we mean by that. In reality, when you look in nature, you do not see many points or perfectly straight lines or perfectly flat surfaces. Okay, we see things that are imperfect and that suggests the possibility that you know what, we might actually be between dimensions. Most lines that you encounter in nature are not perfectly straight. They've got a little bit of wibble, uh, wiggle to them or wobble to them or however you want to say it, which would suggest that while Euclid's line has length but no width and no depth, perhaps our lines that do have length, maybe they do have a little bit of width or a little bit of depth to them, which is what accounts for that bend. And that would place the line actually somewhere in between Euclid's first dimension and second dimension. Obviously, it's not entirely a line, and it's definitely not entirely a plane. It's got to be somewhere in between there. And we see a lot of this with surfaces, like sand dunes and things like like that, uh, little sand drifts. Okay, and again, it's not a it's not a perfectly flat plane, so it doesn't just have length and have width. It's got a little bit of depth to it, which puts it a little bit past the second dimension. Fractal geometry actually works to help us address these issues. Another more practical explanation for fractal geometry is this, and this is where uh, a lot of geometry uh, gurus are going with things on fractal geometry, and this is the idea of nature being self-reflective. Okay, and what that kind of means is if you look at a lot of things in nature on an increasingly smaller scale, 
what you end up seeing is actually smaller representations of the larger picture. Now that's not to say that everything in geom or everything in life, if you look at it under a microscope, all you see is, is smaller versions of itself. For example, if you look at your skin underneath a microscope, you don't see smaller versions of you running around. But there are plenty of examples in nature where this is the case. And fern trees are a particularly accurate example of what uh, they are terming fractal geometry of nature being self reflective. So if you take a, an entire limb off of a fern tree, this is very much what it looks like. You've got the main stalk going down through the middle, and then you have shoots coming off of it, and then off of those shoots are smaller shoots, and then you have leaves coming off of those, and so on. But the idea here is if we were to isolate, you know, a particular one of these smaller shoots, and then remove it and amplify it or magnify it into a larger version, it looks very very, very similar to the overall branch. And then if you continue this process, look at one of those smaller ones and pull it off and look at it, again, it still looks very much like the overall branch. So it's like each little offspring that we take away from the fern bush, what we continue to see is basically self-reflective versions of itself. And there's a lot of in, a lot of places in nature where this happens, not just with plant life, but also with like coastlines and mountain ranges and things like that, where where you can continue to examine things on a smaller and smaller scale and you continue to get uh, kind of a self-reflective version of the larger picture. Okay. So there's an idea, kind of a new age uh, way of thinking of fractal geometry. Now again, we're expected to know all that information uh, about these non-Euclidean geometries, but the majority of our time is going to be spent studying Euclid's geometry. Okay, so spend a little bit of time on those non-Euclidean geometries. Let's get those committed to memory. Let's understand which rules it was that caused Euclid's uh, theories, some problems. We will definitely need to know that. Uh, fill out your summary, questions you you need answered and keep your essential question in mind. Can I tell the difference between the different geometries and do I know the rules that caused those differences?